Hello everyone, I'm here today at the 0pm workshop on prioritisation and we're talking to some of our 0pm researchers, Emma, Hans-Peter and Ian, about PFAS and TFA, specifically planetary boundaries. So Ian, you published a very well received and highly cited paper in 2022 about planetary boundaries. Can you just explain a little bit about what the paper was about? Yeah, sure. Well, we know PFAS are everywhere in the world and in all of us. So in the paper, we wanted to compare the levels of four different PFAS in various environmental media, soils, surface water and rain, with um, environmental guidelines that have been set and health advisories around the world. And we showed that um, pretty much everywhere these guidelines are exceeded for these four PFAS. So this we consider to be a you know, big problem and concern, mm -hmm. and uh, this got a lot of notice from the press. Um, and you know, I think we think TFA is going to be a similar issue because we see over the last few decades that the levels of TFA are going up and up and up, and that we might actually breach these you know, similar guidelines in the future for TFA. Mm -hmm. Gosh. <laughs> uh, so Hans-Peter, I actually understand that you have a similar opinion then about TFA. Yeah, well, the, the TFA paper was kind of thought of as a sequel to Ian's paper because Ian was talking about these very well-known four PFAS for which there's been a lot of research, research and thresholds. But this was to extend the conversation to the short chain uh, PFAS uh, because wh what they have in common is that they're accumulating, they're persistent in the environment and irreversible. So we just see a mass of them increasing now. And I think without any controversy, we can say that there's more TFA by mass on the planet than all the other uh, four PFAS that you mentioned. Uh, and we see that in blood and every media we can measure in trees. And so this is what we think is a concern. Some people might not think it's a concern because we don't know what the impacts are, but we say we don't know what the impacts are yet. And now that there is so much attention, we are actually starting to see impacts such as effects on eye development in embryo. There was a study on eye development in rabbit embryos. Uh, but we also just know that if some kind of effect occurs, it would be a planetary boundary threat because that would occur at a global scale, be irreversible. And so that's why we wanted to follow that up. So what are the main sources of TFA then? Well, there are, there are multiple sources. Uh, one of them is, uh, well, one of the major ones is, is our fluorinated gases, which are mm. commonly used um, for, as refrigerants. Mm. Uh, so air conditioning units and so on. And so these fluorinated gases then break down in the atmosphere, they form TFA and then the TFA typically rains out onto the, into the surface, um, surface waters and soils, and ends up in our, ultimately ends up in our drinking water. But there are, there are many other sources um, of TFA. So there are many different PFAS which can break down and form TFA. Um, if they have one CF3 somewhere in the structure, they typically break down and form TFA. Um, also, well, from our work on um, industrial emissions is also a huge source. So fluoropolymer manufacturing, we made an inventory of emissions from fluoropolymer manufacturing and fluorinty gases actually are also hugely released from um, chloropolymer manufacturing and also from fluorochemical industry generally. Mm. Um, so that, yeah, there are multiple sources of, of TFA. Yeah, no, and I'll just add on to that, that like we don't really know how much each of these sources are contributing. I would say an early conversation was it's mainly the um, degradation products of, of these uh, fluorinated gases, which were used to replace chlorofluorocarbons. And I think in some regions that must be true. It's the only reason to account for the accumulation in the Arctic ice cores, for instance, in, in remote areas. But what they're seeing now in more populated countries that the concentrations of TFA in the groundwater and other cannot be explained by this rain alone. So we know that there are some substantial other sources. Ian may, named one of them, that's fluoropolymer production. This is, uh, it could be quite a high number, but we don't know what that number is yet. Uh, and there's also, yeah, many other sources like of uh, the precursors, but Emma Palm would know the best about that. Yeah. Yes, so if we look just in the PubChem Transformation Library, where we have more like experimentally confirmed precursors of TFA, we know that there are 10 known precursors, but the number is likely a lot higher than that. So for instance, if we look to prediction models, a majority of compounds with a CF3 group is 
predicted to form TFA after a number of reaction steps. And then if we go back to look at Hubchem, we know that almost like six, or even, yeah, six million compounds have a CF3 group. So of course, a, a, at least a fraction of those are likely TFA precursors as well. Gosh, that's, that, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you all say then is your kind of main input to this discussion? What are you hoping that people take forward and work on perhaps? Well, let's just say we're talking about zero pollution of persistent and mobile substances. Our, our project, TFA is a persistent and mobile substance. And we think that now is maybe, well, now is definitely the time that we should really start thinking about how we could reduce emissions. How can, and it could be uh, phasing out these uh, precursors that are F gases, but also looking at what Emma is looking at, these uh, potential precursors from other sources. Are there design substitutes that they could use for the same function, but not produce TFA? We think this is, and we think this, con this conversation is a bit urgent because if we have it too late, it will be too late to have this conversation. When I see TFA, really high, highlights the problem with high persistence. It's almost the poster child for the problem with mm -hmm. high persistence. Because if you continually release a substance which will never break down in the environment, it will accumulate over time. And we see that with TFA. It's just accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. And eventually it will reach some threshold. So highly persistent chem chemicals are problematic. And it's sort of like not just TFA, it's the whole universe mm -hmm. of PFAS yeah. that have this highly persistent property. So... That's one of the reasons why we think they should be phased out as a class. Yeah, and I think also it's important to like, get more information on which compounds might be <clears throat> TFA precursors. So, for instance, if we look at these like 6 million compounds and we only have information for 10 of them, that's a really small fraction. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that we start to close these knowledge gaps. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we've really got lots of work to do then in the Zero PM project. Yeah, yeah, TFA will keep us busy. Yes. <laughs> zero PM. Zero pollution of persistent and mobile substances. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under grant agreement number 10103675